At its height, the British Empire controlled about 13 million square miles of land around the globe. But did you know the second largest empire in world history controlled about 12 million square miles of land? The Mongol Empire, which predated the British Empire by several hundred years, was unique. Their nomadic empire was more extensive than the Roman Empire and radically altered the course of history, even establishing a Pax Mongolica. It began in 1279 and lasted until the end of the empire, bringing peace, trade, and increased travel to the region. When most people hear of the Mongols, they think of conquest and violence. After all, they were famous horsemen and warriors, tearing across Asia and Eastern Europe. Some have depicted the Mongols as violent, merciless conquerors. But the truth of the Mongol Empire is a little more complicated. The Mongol Empire's primary goal was not to destroy its neighbors and its plans to gain more power and land. The Mongols were usually tolerant of other cultures and civilizations. They stayed true to their culture while allowing the people they conquered to maintain their traditions. The Mongol Empire successfully strengthened itself, but the Mongols gave the world more than violent stories about Genghis Khan. Looking more closely at its history, we can see how successful this empire was and wonder how it influenced modern life. How did the Mongol Empire begin? Most people believe the Mongols began with Genghis Khan. While he was essential to the beginning of the empire, the Mongol people had been around for many years before his birth. They lived in the eastern parts of the Great Eurasian Steppe, centralized in modern Mongolia and northern China. The steppes were incredibly inhospitable. Frigid winter temperatures, lack of agrarian land, and harsh landscapes all made the Mongolian plains appear uninhabitable at first glance. Of course, this did not stop the Mongolians, and historians believe the first people arrived on these plains tens of thousands of years ago. However, people do not appear to have settled until they domesticated horses around 3500 BCE. With horses, the nomadic tribes could develop an equine-based nomadic society, which they bolstered with metalwork. They quickly became powerful enough to establish the Xiongnu Empire at the end of the 3rd century BCE. They fell to the Chinese Han Dynasty during the late 1st century CE and were replaced by the Zhanbei Confederation, although it didn't last more than two centuries. The area saw turmoil for years as the Mongolic people fought off the Turks and the Chinese. The Mongolic tribes also fought with each other for supremacy, which only increased tension. Of course, Mongolia also saw times of unification throughout the chaos, and one of the critical leaders was Aboji, who united all of Inner Mongolia. While his military achievements were impressive, he is most famous for his administrative reforms. Aboji set up two different systems to better serve the sedentary and nomadic portions of the population. The sedentary population was primarily located in northern China, so they used traditional Chinese bureaucracy. The nomadic people continued to utilize their conventional tribal rule with some higher-level organizations to help Aboji maintain control. While the tribal leaders criticized him, his innovation became the model all future Mongol leaders used to lead their people. Aboji ruled the Khitan Empire, which included parts of China and Korea. The Chinese did not appreciate it, and after years of fighting, they crushed the Khitan Empire during the early 12th century. However, the Mongols were rugged and determined people, and soon a little boy named Temujin was born in Mongolia. You may know him better as Genghis Khan. He was born around 1162 CE as Kabul Khan's grandson. His father, Yesuke, was the leader of the remainder of the Khitan Empire, a shell of its former self. His family garnered respect, but Temujin did not grow up with the luxuries we usually associate with royalty. When Temujin was about 9 or 10 years old, his father died, and the clan refused to take his surviving family with them. The family had to worry about starvation and attacks from other clans. Through several years of hardship, Temujin learned the importance of families and how to use his charisma to gain allies, which he knew were essential to success and survival. Jemuka, another Mongolian tribal leader who had previously allied with Temujin, attempted to challenge his new leadership, but he only set up Temujin as more merciful and trustworthy, prompting more people to join this rising leader. Temujin had an excellent mind for warfare, and he quickly realized the Chinese Jin dynasty was maintaining its power in Mongolia by encouraging infighting among the tribes. To stop the cyclical nature of Mongolian wars, 
Temujin changed his military style. When he defeated a tribe, he arrested and executed the leaders for treason, but allowed everyone else to assimilate into his people instead of allowing plundering and murder. He set to work unifying the steppes. He was sure to value honor in battle, which earned him the respect of capable warriors who soon helped lead his army to more victories. In 1206, Temujin had enough followers and supporters to call for a Mongolian tribal assembly. There, he claimed the title of Khan and changed his name to Genghis, which is how we get Genghis Khan today. This was the start of the Mongol Empire. Genghis Khan created the first Mongolian law code, established administrations and judicial systems, and even reorganized the army and tribal structure. The great Mongol nation did not have aristocratic titles because Genghis Khan valued merit over heredity. Genghis Khan set the Mongol Empire up for success, giving them the structure they needed to impact world history like few empires ever had before. How did the Mongols build the second largest empire in world history? Uniting Mongolia would have been enough for some leaders. However, Genghis Khan was happy to continue expanding steering his army out of Mongolia and across Asia. Although he initially began Mongolian expansion into Siberia in 1207 CE, Genghis Khan's genuine interest was in China. His troops were paid to plunder, so their loyalty depended upon continued raids. The Chinese Jin Dynasty also demanded tribute in 1210, which helped fuel the Mongolian drive to conquer the Chinese lands after Genghis Khan refused to pay. Before attacking the Jin Dynasty, Genghis Khan turned his army to the Shishi estate. It was a common Mongolian target, and the cities were less fortified than Jin cities, making raids statistically more successful. He attacked in 1209 with around 70,000 soldiers and quickly defeated the Shia army, the first organized force the Mongolians had ever faced. However, Genghis Khan encountered issues with the siege of Yinchuan, Shishi's capital, because he did not have siege equipment at the time. But after almost a year, Genghis Khan finally captured the capital and won the Shishia's vassalage, adding them to his growing empire. While Genghis Khan had won this significant victory, he did not want to rush into war with China, although he refused to submit to the new Jin Emperor. He used the knowledge gleaned from defectors from the Jin Empire and called a meeting with his followers to discuss the possibility of going to war with China. After much talk and a three-day prayer, the Mongol army was ready setting out in the spring of 1211. As they marched to the capital, the Mongols picked up additional troops who defected from the Jins, and they captured several towns before meeting the Jin army and destroying it around October 1211. The Mongol advance continued until 1215. By the time the capital finally surrendered, Genghis Khan had defeated three Jin armies, and his troops had amassed vast wealth. Genghis Khan also collected artisans, engineers, and physicians, usually lacking among the Mongolians, and learned the art of siege warfare. He had successfully conquered the Chinese and added their wealth and cultural learning to the Mongol Empire. However, Genghis Khan was always looking for the next opportunity, so by 1217 he had lost interest in China. He stationed trusted generals in crucial areas like northern China and Manchuria and turned his attention west. The Karakitai garnered his attention located just west of Central Asia, they were remnants of the Liao dynasty. In 1208, Kuklug arrived in the city with great power and married into the Karakitai ruler's family. A few years later, he rebelled, seizing the throne and increasing Muslim persecution. Some oppressed Muslim believers asked Genghis Khan for help, and he obliged by sending his two most trusted generals to take the region. They trounced Kuklug taking land in modern-day Kazakhstan and pushing farther west, finally reaching the Persians. It may seem strange that the Mongols played such a bloody role in Persian history, but the most bizarre part may be that Genghis Khan had no interest in conquering land that far west. The Khwarezmians ruled it then, and it was one of the most powerful Middle Eastern states, expanding like the Mongol Empire. Genghis Khan attempted to establish friendly relations with their ruler, Allah ad-Din Muhammad II, Unfortunately, he called himself the ruler of the rising sun and Muhammad the ruler of the setting sun. This statement greatly offended the Khwarezmian ruler, who opened hostilities despite Mongol protests that they were not interested in war. The battle ended in a draw, but Genghis Khan was willing to ignore the incident, 
In 1218, he sent diplomats to the Persian court to establish trade relations. Muhammad rejected this, feeling Genghis Khan was trying to force him into vassalage. When Genghis Khan sent a trade caravan with 500 camels and a vast quantity of riches, the Persians raided the train and killed all the merchants except one outside the town of Vatrar. Historians do not know if their governor, Inilkuk, acted on Muhammad's orders or acted of his own accord. Still, when Genghis Khan demanded Muhammad punish this general, the Khwarezmian leader killed one diplomat and shaved the other two. With that, Genghis Khan officially declared war. The Mongol attack on Khwarezmian began in 1219, with Genghis Khan leading the army as he traditionally did. He was almost 60 then, but still used his sharp military skills to conquer the Khwarezmian Empire quickly. They mercilessly destroyed Otrar in February 1220, and Genghis Khan sent his two sons off with parts of the army to take other cities. If cities surrendered, they were spared and incorporated. If they resisted, they were obliterated. Meanwhile, Genghis Khan led his portion of the army to take cities like Narota and Bukhara. Narota surrendered peacefully, and Genghis Khan treated the city well, partially because it was a Muslim pilgrimage destination. Bukhara, on the other hand, fought back. When Genghis Khan finally took the city, he made an example out of them for resisting and for having many of his stolen goods. The Mongols destroyed mosques and schools, burned the town, and tortured, raped, and murdered citizens. From this incident, Genghis Khan became known as the punishment of God for the Muslims. He soon took the capital in late March 1220 and turned his attention to India, the only significant threat left to his power in Asia. Genghis Khan's military exploits were critical to the Mongol Empire's success. He was dedicated to providing for his troops and protecting his people. Even in the last few years of his life, he was planning new raids and opportunities for expansion. He also valued honor, loyalty, skilled work, and learning, strengthening his empire. However, the empire was so big that it did not last long after Genghis Khan died. He passed in August 1227, leaving an empire already struggling to hold on to its conquered lands. His death marked the end of an era and the beginning of the end of the Mongol Empire. It held on until 1368, but it was too big to sustain. It eventually crumbled as Mongol leaders fought each other for power. But although the Mongol Empire has faded into history, its success and impact on the world will not be forgotten. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the Mongol Empire, check out our book. The Mongol Conquests, a captivating guide to the invasions and conquests initiated by Genghis Khan that created the vast Mongol Empire. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.